Good afternoon and thank you for joining us. I'm Bridget Anderson, the President and CEO of the Greater Vancouver Board of Trade. Today we are gathered on the traditional territory of the Coast Salish peoples, the Squamish, Musqueam and Tsleil-Waututh Nations. And welcome to TransLink CEO Kevin Desmond's annual address, his last one with us as he prepares to transition to his new role. After five years behind the wheel at TransLink, Kevin will step down in February. The world has changed immeasurably since Kevin's previous address to Metro Vancouver's business community. Like many businesses, the pandemic has forced TransLink to rethink how it delivers services. However, the why it delivers services has not changed. A robust transportation system is still key to our region's long-term prosperity. Today, we'll hear from TransLink about the future of transportation, economic recovery, and some of the big questions they're tackling to keep our cities moving. And we encourage you to take part in this conversation. We are using Slido so you can submit questions. Just go to slido.com and the password for today is TransLink2020. Before we get underway, it takes a lot of support to put together an event like this one. And we would like to acknowledge our presenting sponsor, Stantec. Supporting sponsor, Boyden. Community sponsor, the University of British Columbia. Our production partner, Oh Boy Productions. And preferred media partner, Business in Vancouver. And this event is presented in partnership with World Trade Center Vancouver. We also want to thank our long-standing sponsors called our Pillar Partners, and they include TELUS, CN, YVR, BCIT, and Air Canada. We are very grateful for the support of these five organizations whose annual partnerships and commitments enable the work of the Board of Trade. I now have the pleasure of introducing Transit Team Lead, Firas Altahan, from our presenting sponsor, Stantec, for some introductory remarks. But before I turn the mic over, a reminder to please log on to slido.com to submit or vote for questions, and the event passcode is TransLink2020. Over to you, Firas. Good afternoon, everyone, and a warm welcome from Stantec's Lynn Valley Studios, otherwise known as my basement. I'm Firas Altahan, and I'm the Transit Lead at Stantec here based in Vancouver. We're very pleased to be here today to welcome Kevin Desmond, CEO of TransLink, to talk about his organization's thoughts on the future. Very few things have touched our lives as much as a major crisis such as COVID-19. Tough questions have quite rightly been asked. Questions such as, are we doing enough for the safety of our passengers and staff? When will patronage return? How do we restore confidence? How are we to fund our capital program? Should we reprioritize our projects? But these questions were in fact raised in 2005 by Transport for London Commissioner Bob Kiley and Ken Livingston following the 2005-77 attacks in London. Patronage plummeted, confidence in the system suffered, rail and transit services ground to a halt. The emergency services struggled, funding became an issue, the economy took a hit, politicians scrambled. The transit agency had a tremendous volume of capital work such as new trains, new yards and improvements to the bus fleet to deliver. Forgive me if any of this sounds familiar. As I was anticipating making this introduction, I found myself thinking about my time as a Transport for London graduate. Based upon my experience, the message I want to share is the safety of staff and passengers remain paramount. Ridership will return and we as a forum should never stop asking ourselves, what's next? Interestingly, the former Transport for London Commissioner Bob Kiley, another American, had a spell at the CIA. While I'm in favour of public service, I hope Kevin's talents remain focused on transit rather than intelligence. A key part of Kevin's role at, at TransLink uh, is participation at the Mayor's Council. It didn't take long uh, to identify these events focused on the pressing issues for Vancouver's transit system. I've had the pleasure of joining and supporting Kevin during a council meeting last summer. What struck me was the sheer volume of prep work undertaken by Kevin and his team to fulfill their commitment at council. The team at Stantec loves to be part of this kind of engagement. How could we make the community better? COVID-19 has only amplified that sentiment. We at Stantec look forward to contributing our expertise to the discussion as we continue to work with Transic on many expansion and enhancement projects. We want to help answer what's next for the battery bus rollout, the funding gap, the Burnaby gondola or the rapid transit system. We have our ideas. These projects will ultimately touch millions of users. It takes vision and broad perspective to manage all of this. Kevin and his team have a richness of experience that make them uniquely qualified for this challenge. But arguably, other cities have been through worse. What can we learn from them in planning? What's next? Kevin has many more accomplishments, including spells at Seattle and New York, but I'm not going to run through these now in the event he's having second thoughts. You never quite know where these headhunters pop up. So on behalf of the Greater Vancouver Board of Trade and the team at Stantec, I'd like to take this opportunity to welcome Kevin Desmond. Thank you. 
Thank you. Farah, it's great to see you again. Thank you for that introduction. And I can tell you, if I was moving into the intelligence community, I wouldn't be telling you here or anywhere else now, would I? So nice try, my friend. Uh, and thank you, Bridget, as, as well. Um, uh, I'd like to first begin by acknowledging uh, that we are gathering today on the traditional tale, uh, territory of the Coast Salish peoples. I also want to um, personally again thank and commend our frontline workers at, at TransLink. You know, these last number of months, they've been out in the front um, in dealing with, with this crisis in a, in a commendable way, uh, keeping our transit service operating, providing service uh, initially to uh, people that, that needed it, it's the only way they could get around, and now is our ridership's coming back. But great job to our bus operators, our SkyTrain attendants, and all the other fine men and women of, of our organization. And of course, thanks to uh, the team at the Greater Vancouver uh, Board of Trade uh, for convening uh, today's event. I've always enjoyed uh, coming to the, uh, the GVBOT. Uh, and in fact, as, um, uh, as Bridget pointed out, this is my last address uh, to the uh, Board of Trade, and it's bittersweet. In point of fact, my very first public event uh, after I started in, in early 2016 was a Board of Trade event. It was a transportation uh, forum. I was joined on stage by former mayors uh, Robertson and, and Hepner. Uh, so it's, it's always been my pleasure uh, to come and, and address uh, this organization, albeit uh, remotely. So what I'm going to talk a little bit today is, is a little reflection on my four and a half years uh, at TransLink here in Vancouver, uh, including, of course, looking back on this, this incredible year of, uh, of, of 2020. But I'm also going to look at the future, uh, because that's really what I think about all the time, is what's next? What are the next big things uh, we should be thinking about uh, as an organization and as a community? I'm going to dwell on three themes initially, but I, I, I hope that they'll be consistent through about, throughout much of, of my address and maybe our, our Q&A. These are the, among the pillars of how I've tried to manage TransLink and our awesome agenda um, over these uh, years. Uh, and these pillars are important both internally managing a large, complex, bureaucratic organization like TransLink, but also externally, because we have an awesome public responsibility at TransLink. So first of, of my pillars is engagement. With that awesome public responsibility comes an understanding that we're essential to this community. So we must be in the community. So engagement with the public has, has always been part of my focus and really encouraging my team uh, and our partners to, to understand how we can be out communicating in small group community events all the way to our huge T2050 public engagement uh, more than a year ago. Being out amongst our, our community, understanding and listening to what is interest, what, what's important to them and how we can reflect their interests in, in our uh, program. And that goes the same with employee engagement. You on the, uh, in the call today, the, uh, the audience today, you business folks, I'm sure you're thinking about employee engagement all the time as well. Well, in a large organization of 8,000 people, we have to be focused on that too. Second is partnerships. You know, I always tell my, my folks, we never do anything alone. I never do anything alone. I rely on, on my, my, my staff, the people of, of our organization. In fact, a large complex organization like TransLink is completely uh, interdependent. And similarly, partnerships external to TransLink, if anything else, are more and more important. Um, strong, it starts with strong work, working relations with our government partners. The Mayor's Council, very, very important, um, and, and the province. But of course, community groups, other employers, business organizations, the private sector, our, our supporters, our vendors, and even innovators. We've got to find ways, continue to find ways to partner and partner smart for excellent objectives. Uh, and connections. It's really the heart of everything we do, isn't it? Connecting to customers. My, my, the board, when they hired me, they charged me improved customer experience. So connecting to the customers, making sure we're doing everything we can to improve their experience because that drives ridership. It drives our, uh, our, our purpose, our mission in life. And of course, transit connects people. It connects people to their jobs, to school, to their leisure time, to their loved ones and friends. When you put these three attributes together, the result is 
uh, and it works organically, it creates consensus. And consensus allows and, and facilitates change, which leads to action. And my modus operandi in leading TransLink is get stuff done. And we have to do that by combining all three of these attributes, create a common understanding, a common direction for an organization, and it then enables us to make things happen. And I'd like to believe in my four and a half years here at TransLink has allowed us to make things um, happen. So uh, this is my bittersweet picture, a little sepia tone. This was exactly a year ago today where we were gathered uh, at one of the hotel ball ballrooms and I was giving my, my fourth uh, annual address uh, to the Greater Vancouver uh, Board of Trade. And it's, it's bittersweet in the sense it just reminds us of what we got to do before COVID, right? Where we could meet and greet and gather together, network, socialize, have those impromptu uh, conversations. And yes, I could make eye contact with my audience to see if they're interested in, uh, in what I've, I, I've talked about. And of course, 2020, we all know this, has been just an astonishing year, a global pandemic, wildfires, moth invasions, murder hornets, a couple of very consequential uh, elections, and they're still counting votes both here and across the border. My prediction is we're gonna have a massive snowstorm on Christmas Eve, it just has to happen. Uh, certainly in our world uh, in transit, that would put the cherry on the cake of, of this year. So much has changed. But uh, it symbolizes what I hope we eventually, of course, come back to when we can put this, this terrible pandemic uh, behind us. So before I, I look to the future, let me just be a little bit uh, retrospective. As I said, the whole, this whole year for us has been somewhat bittersweet. We are on such a roll uh, at, at TransLink. We were named the top transit agency in North America just over a year ago in New York at the, public, at the uh, American Public Transportation Association, setting ri ridership records year after years, delivering historic levels of investments in partnership with, with our senior government partners, advancing an aggressive customer experience action plan, and developing a new 30-year transport plan. We were breaking new ground, we were applying worldwide best practices, and we were testing new directions. Now, the momentum wasn't just about what we did in our organization. The momentum was facilitated because this region has set itself, set itself up very well for the success story that we've had over these years on the mobility front. In fact, just to give you a stat, some 93% of all jobs in our region are easily accessible within four to 800 meters of transit. I was in a, a transit conference uh, a couple of weeks ago and the mayor of Los Angeles gave the keynote address and he pointed out fewer than one third of the jobs in the city of Los Angeles are accessible by, trans by transit. That's why they're trying to fast forward and build up a massive transit system over the next 20 years down there. We have a lot going for us. Uh, and it's the result of decades of purposeful training, planning and policies that have been done with a regional commitment to regional um, outcomes. So these fundamentals, of course, have brought us to this current reality. And, you know, COVID-19 has just changed um, everything. We, we put this picture up because I'm sure the audience, this, this photo, these photos look very familiar to you. It's all, it's been our lives, those of us that have been working from home uh, for month uh, after month. And I certainly believe there are pros and cons to that. And I bet you all of you on, the, on, on this call um, see the pros and cons of working from home. And I think these photographs maybe um, illustrate a little bit of that. We've been thinking a lot about the future of work. Now, why are we thinking about the future of work at TransLink? One, we're a big employer. We have to try to understand and predict what the lasting change might be as an employer for our employees. But of course, number two, it's going to have a profound or potentially profound impact on transit demand and our network planning. Now, we don't know, none of us know how lasting these, these effects are going to be, but we have to be looking forward now. We have to understand how to be resilient in the face of the near term as well as, as the longer term uh, potential change, changes associated with that. Now, even as many people are able to work, home, work from home, let's remember um, that not everyone can work from home. In fact, Stats Canada estimates that um, only about 40% of our jobs can be done remotely. Well, what about the other 60%? Even at our lowest point in April, May, and June with, with COVID, we were still transporting tens of thousands of frontline workers. And we had to be focused on how to keep them safe and healthy. So we turned to soap. Now, of course, we all think of soap as washing our hands for 20 seconds, 
Um, but SOAP for us is the safe operating action plan. And in the first few months of the COVID emergency, it was 24-7 emergency management at, Tra at TransLink and our subsidiary organizations. We were improvising, we were making stuff up as we went along, we were innovating, and we were creating. And we're still trying to do that in the face of the still unfolding um, pandemic. We've increased cleaning and sanitization, managing physical space, providing more service to enable more physical space, customer education, uh, and on August 24th, mandatory mask policy. Our most recent open call for innovation was themed around improving the health and safety of, of our public. We know that our challenge is restoring the trust and confidence of our current and former riders in taking transit, and it's gonna uh, take some time to make that happen. And we continue to look for partnerships with private sector uh, to find other ways to restore that trust and confidence. Um, now, the good news is our SOAP plan, which is very much uh, um, uh, informed by worldwide best practices, worldwide is working. I'm showing you some headlines here from, from news outlets, whether it's here in Vancouver, um, overseas. What we found is that there is no evidence of community transmission of COVID on public transport throughout the world. We've seen photos of crowded trains in Taipei and Tokyo and, and China, and they're not, it's not a, a spreader. And we're very pleased that here, the public health um, uh, ministry in, in this province also has said there's not a single case of COVID transmission. Now, we have to be vigilant and we have to be patient to, re to restore our ridership. This gives you the sense of, of, of what happened. We fell off a cliff. Uh, third week of March, all of a sudden our ridership just fell. Uh, at, at the lowest of low, uh, we had lost 83% um, of our ridership. We were bleeding revenue, $75 million a month initially uh, uh, bleeding revenue. And it was an existential crisis for us, um, and certainly in terms of our funding going forward. Uh, thanks to um, a pledge by the province in May that they would work with us to find ways to, to um, help us restore um, portions of that revenue. Uh, it, um, we, we could move forward with a certain degree of confidence that led in September to the joint announcement from the federal government in the province of $644 million in aid. That will get us through 2021. We can keep service levels as they are today and work confidently to focus on our safe operating action plan, keeping service on the road, but we still have a challenge. We have a very, very significant structural deficit. It's going to take time uh, to resolve that. That's the next big push that we're going to have with our policymakers here in the region and with the province and perhaps with the federal government going forward. So that is yet work to be done. We've been working on scenarios, a lot of scenario planning. I'm sure you as business people um, have been doing your own scenario plannings, whether you're a small retail or a restaurant outfit or a large corporation. We're all thinking about how will this unfold? What does it mean to our bottom line? Now, as Fraz said, um, which I, and I appreciate that, that lead in, um, I believe, and I think many of you listening here today, believe that a robust transportation system goes hand in hand with a thriving and vibrant metropolitan region. I've always believed that through my career, and that hasn't changed one bit uh, during this COVID crisis. And in fact, we should not let the, the pandemic crisis derail our long-term vision for mobility and sustainable development in Metro Vancouver. We have to think beyond the pandemic about the community we want to call home. Now, um, the challenges facing our region um, are the same challenges in my mind that existed prior uh, to COVID. Even as we're thinking about what the world looks like 30 days from now, 30 weeks from now, um, we've got to continue to think of the long game and be focused on the long game. What were those big issues that we were facing prior to COVID and which I believe are still quite relevant post-COVID? Uh, housing and land use. We know that housing availability and affordability was a problem then, and we saw in the housing market, even this summer, housing market didn't fall. Prices were still strong. People were buying. That does it. So affordability and availability is still going to remain an issue. We've got to partner with Metro Vancouver on, on its advancing its regional growth strategy so that we can have the best transportation plan as an excellent land use plan. So that partnership with Metro and the, and the regional growth strategy is absolutely essential to help address housing, housing affordability and availability going forward. And it's also gonna affect how we do our network planning 
Do we continue to think of an intensive development pattern versus extensive, mean broadening and sprawling out over the region? Probably we have to think of a little bit of both in order to address this issue. Traffic congestion, you know, it's building back already. In fact, traffic congestion is coming back a lot faster than transit ridership. Once we're done with the pandemic and we slowly but surely start returning to normal and the economy returns, even with that issue of the, return, the future of work and how many people start returning to work on a full-time basis, we know traffic's going to come back. Uh, nature abhors a vacuum. So if there's space on the roads, cars will fill them up. So we don't want to fall back into a trap where more and more people lose the habit of using other modes to get around and revert to their single occupant uh, car. That will ultimately also undermine uh, the economy and our overall quality of life. And of course, the climate, climate change hasn't, hasn't uh, taken a break from COVID. Yeah, for a few months when nobody was traveling around, there was less air pollution, less car pollution, but it's gonna come back. We have to remain very fo focused on sustainable, and green plans and policy and actions across the board. We at TransLink have our own aggressive strategy to reduce our emissions 80% uh, by 2050 and hopefully 100% um, renewables um, uh, by then. We're, we're beginning to test and deploy electric buses with, some, with a little bit of financial help. We're gonna continue to focus on, on that. These issues are all connected and founded on quality of life. That's my kind of, my raison d'etre for this business. What we do, in public transportation is, I think, improve quality of life because we provide choices to people. And choices are a really big part, isn't it, of a high quality of life. So what is our region gonna look like in 30 years? I'm always thinking you know, the long game, even as I'm managing today's issue of the day, we're thinking uh, long game. TransLink, we're gonna resume. We took a pause because of COVID. We're gonna resume the work that we started a year ago on what we call T2050, transport, uh, 2050. When we did the public outreach, our engagement outreach, um, over a year ago, we found three main driving values in this community. A love of nature and, and how we value our ability to get out in our fantastic natural environment here and making sure we're preserving not only our natural habitat, but having great access to all those wonderful natural um, amenities that we have. Providing access and lots of choices for access for all the different things, um, our activities in our daily life. And yes, providing more and better transit. And I would add to that more and better options for how uh, to get around. So COVID has, has certainly upended that to a certain degree. And we know that we're gonna have to maybe rethink some of the, the, the approaches that we took to mobility, but we have to do it with that grain of salt, not really knowing how the future is going to um, unfold. But we believe that those, same, those three values I mentioned will remain the guiding elements of our planning and should guide what we like to call our big moves. And when we go back out for public engagement in the spring of, of next year, we're gonna be looking at some of these big moves and testing these big moves um, with the public and getting really good feedback to see how we can better shape these various different moves and make sure that we're getting the big moves right, even as we're also showing lines on the map, the, uh, the network planning. So some of these big moves, reimagining our streets. We've seen throughout the world and certainly here uh, in the Vancouver region, different ways to now think of the street, you know, uh, the streets and, and make better use of what's a very crowded uh, right of way, traffic calming, so-called uh, slow, uh, uh, slow streets for walking and cycling have proliferated in North America uh, and, uni uh, and, and Europe. Cities have repurposed their sidewalks for patios to support struggling restaurants and, and, and still give us the opportunity to go out uh, and, dine, and dine safely. Transit priority, I was very happy to see that the Vancouver Board of Trade continues, thank you very much, Bridget, uh, can, continues to focus on helping to find some of that extra priority to make buses more, uh, move faster and more reliable. Active transportation, that was a big thing that's come out of COVID, uh, hasn't it? There was a headline in uh, CNN um, uh, some months ago that bicycles are the new toilet paper. Um, amusing as it was, you couldn't find a bike. Right? Uh, whether it's the old fashioned um, human powered bike or electric bikes. And electric bikes very much can be a game changer. We've got to be thinking, I think, much more aggressively uh, to enhance the active transportation uh, environment. And that's something I think that should show up in our T2050 planning. 
as well 15 minute neighborhoods where you can do almost anything uh, within 15 minutes by walking, biking, rolling. Um, it's convenient, it's safe, it's relaxing. And you can then use a car or public transit, high capacity transit to take, take your longer trips. All of these things on the screen are good for the environment, they're good for public health, and they're good for community building. Those are, those are many of the themes and values that should be showing up in our T2050 public engagement. And of course, rethinking the personal car. So on the one hand, we're trying to make transport more and better at the human scale, as I just talked about on the prior slides, the old fashioned way, walking, taking a, a bike. But we also know we're on the cusp of big change uh, with, with the personal car. And over really the next 10 years, uh, as automated vehicles really start to penetrate our environment, this is going to be a disruption event. And we've got to be thinking about what the good and the bad of that, those dis that disruptive event is going to mean. On the one hand, it should open up the door for uh, uh, facilitating abundant access to shared vehicles. We need to make sure that it's available to all walks of life. So social equity needs to be a big part of that. But we also have to guard against the negative side of that as a proliferation of robot cars just, just clogging up our, our streets. One thing we know, though, this is going to be uh, a disruptor. And we need to think smart now about how to best use the streets that those automated uh, vehicles are going to be operating on. Now, I mentioned earlier reshaping the region, uh, the work we're doing with, uh, with Metro Vancouver. This is an illustration from our, our great um, uh, tent at the PE last uh, a summer ago, back in the good old days when we could go to the PE. And lots of people showed up here and tried to envision how the lower man lane might uh, uh, play out from a network analysis side. We need to understand, do we need to, to, con to continue with density and high density of, uh, development around transit nodes and in our city centers, or do we need to, to understand how better to serve the suburban communities where there, where there are more housing opportunities and more affordable housing opportunities? This is, this is what we're, we're focused on now uh, in our planning work, and we want to go out for public engagement again in the spring and talk about this intensive versus extensive or the combination of both. Our planners at TransLink believe it's going to be a bit of a combination of both. But here, that's what's at stake over these next 30 years. What are the mobility services? What are the mobility features and investments we need to make that link up a good land use plan with excellent mobility plans? This, this image sort of gives you a sense of that mapping. Now, I've been thinking a lot about cities. And I know the Board of Trade has been thinking about a lot about the future of cities. Uh, downtown environments, urban environments, they're suffering. Uh, there are not a lot of people downtown, and that means people aren't going to restaurants and keeping those restaurants or the, or the, uh, the retailers uh, thriving. Um, I personally believe, even though we're going through a tough time now, and there's some grave concerns about whether or not these businesses will survive, but at the end of the day, we are social creatures, aren't we? I want to go back to a hockey game. I want to go back to be able to go out to a really nice dinner event. I want to go to the symphony. I want to go back to work and see all my people at work. Those are the environments where we, where we create, where we connect and we innovate. And that bringing of the people together, there's really no, I don't think there's, there, there's an alternative to that. Yes, we can do things like we're doing today remotely, but I still believe in cities. And if you look at these images, the beautiful uh, image of, of densely populated high-rise uh, downtown Vancouver or city of Surrey, I, in my apartment in, uh, in New Westminster, I looked south across the Fraser River in these last four and a half years, seeing all these towers popping up in city in Surrey Center. Um, we saw in the election campaign um, just these last few weeks, um, the, the, uh, the, the NDP talked a lot about we're going to get SkyTrain to Langley. They believe in this. They still believe in high capacity transit linking up our urban centers. I read in the paper the other day. Uh, there's development applications near our inlet station on the Evergreen Line in, in Coquitlam so for new towers um, around, uh, around the SkyTrain station on Evergreen. There is a faith, I believe, a continuing faith in the need to provide these high capacity connections in dense urban environments to take you where you want to go um, all over the region. Uh, so I think there, there's still a really strong reason for making these investments. I get asked all the time, why are we still doing Surrey Langley SkyTrain, Broadway Subway? Let's think long game. All, these, all the things, all the, the issues 
all the factors that drove high capacity transit in the future will continue to do that. Now, movement's a big word to me. I've always been fascinated by the word movement since I was a, since I was a teenager. And at the end of the day, that's what I do. That's what we do you know, in our business. The founders of, of TransLink gave TransLink a multimodal mandate. And the provision of bus and train and sea bus and handy dart service is important, but so are the, all the other ways of getting around. We want all of the above at, at, at TransLink. And our mission is to succeed with that multimodal environment uh, in, the, in the future. Now, we know these next, uh, this next decade is going to be fascinating. Electrification, automation, artificial intelligence is going to have a vast impact on how we get around. So I want to leave you this in, in closing. Um, we have a saying at TransLink, uh, together all the way. You know, my three themes for the day, engagement, partnerships, connections, it all is about working together, building cons uh, consensus, give us, give us the license for action and get stuff done. When this region works together, thinks well as a region, we have proven that we can get things done. So I think our motto is, is, is a great way to leave my remarks and turn it back to Bridget, and I will look forward to your questions and questions from the audience. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kevin. And although Kevin and I are in the studio together, we are socially distant, we're not really able to kind of look at each other here. We're looking at our cameras so that we can include all of you in the conversation. That is the fun of having a virtual event. So Kevin, I am speaking to you, but I'm not looking at you. Um, I do want to focus on long-term, but before we do that, I wanna focus on short-term and I wanna focus on COVID. Uh, particularly the impacts around COVID, because you talked about the significant impact on revenues and, and the way that many people have described the, need, the way that we're going to get through this in the absence of a vaccine, because that's going to take some time, is dealing with the levers around health and safety and around confidence. So what are some of the key things that need to happen to build that trust and confidence that you mentioned to get people back riding transit again? Well, that's the enduring question. Boy, we've been thinking about that um, for months. And, you know, we've been connected to worldwide conversation. Everyone in my space is thinking about the, the exact same um, issue. Trust and confidence are, without a doubt, the key words. So the, the first thing is we want to demonstrate that we're doing everything in our power to make sure when you get on a bus, when you get on a train, that we're, we're looking after your, your public health. So those are the issues of making sure there's enough distancing on buses and trains. And with very few exceptions, we're not seeing a lot of crowding. Improving the sanitization. I expect we're gonna have some announcements coming up about some, uh, some pilots associated with that uh, some more. And just and thinking about um, where science can, can lead us to improve the health environment um, on the trains. And of course, it's up to us as individuals to do the things we're supposed to do, wear a mask, wash your hands, don't touch your um, eyes and face, and, and so forth. But we also know that we don't want to bring people back too fast. We don't want to overcrowd those trains. We, don't want, we want to make sure, even though we've seen no spread of COVID in public transit anywhere in the world from my, my previous slide, we also know we have to be really patient with that. We want to build the environment so that once there is a vaccine, once we can see the light at the end of the tunnel, people will come back and come back relatively quickly. So in the meantime, we want to assure our, our customers we're doing everything we can. You can be safe uh, taking public transportation within, within reason. Um, take the train or the bus when you can. We welcome you back. It's, it's, a, it's a great environment. And when we see the light at the end of the tunnel, everybody come on back. And how key is getting people back to work? You mentioned the downtown core, and this is something that at the Board of Trade we talk about all the time. I sit in the office when I go to the office, I'm not working from home, and I look out on the streets and it looks like a Sunday morning at 8 a.m. And so we have about 10 to 40% office capacity depending on some of those uh, studies out there. So encouraging people to come back to the office when it is safe to do so, I mean, that to me seems like that is going to be one of the biggest uh, hills. Once that's been climbed, that momentum will start to build. So what can uh, business and government and TransLink do to work together to get people, encouraging them to come back? Oh, that's a great question. We started uh, about a month or so ago, six weeks ago, our sort of our ridership campaign. Now, it's a little bit low volume for the reasons I just discussed below. We want to sort of temper how fast people come back. And, and one of the hallmarks of that, actually, is reaching out to the business communities. I believe we've done something like 100 webinars already to businesses throughout the region and, and more to come. 
Part of it is to tell them the things we're doing, but also is to ask them what more, more can we can do to um, get people to come back taking transit, but also what other mobility options and choice. But you know, we, we certainly need to get people coming back to work, um, at least in significant numbers. You know, think about this. If um, one day a week everybody stays home working post-COVID, that's a 20% reduction in people mm -hmm. moving around. So that's on the one hand a good thing, maybe 20% less traffic, but it's also 20% taking transit. Um, and that's going to have an issue. That's going to be an issue for our, our long-term revenues. And it will be an issue that's also 20% less sales in the downtown merchants and restaurants right, that rely on that day-to-day -day activity of people coming back to work. So I, that's why I believe in cities, and that's why I think cities, bringing cities back, that urban environment really is important. It's good for our bottom line, it's good for the businesses that have been supporting cities, and it's good for that urban, uh, that urban excitement, right? So I think we want to we want to join that conversation with the business community to figure out how we get people coming back to work in the downtown. And again, we know until the, the crisis is over, that's going to be a tough sell. And, and you know, uh, trend, numbers are going up in this in this region. So we have to be very cautious at this time. And as you say, I mean, I love looking at those pictures that you showed in your presentation of people working from home because we have perhaps uh, forever altered the way that people are going to work. We're we're going to be maybe in some sort of hybrid model where there will be people who work from home more than they worked in the office. And I don't know that we're going to get back to a place where everybody was back in the office like we were in, in March. And that will impact transit. Yeah. Yeah, we, this is, you know, as I said uh, as well, we, 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 don't, we can't predict this. We don't know. We've got scenarios. We've got to think about that. You know, our ridership could come back very quickly in a couple of years. It could take eight years. Um, based on some of our scenarios to recover um, former um, prior to uh, COVID ridership. Um, I, I can tell you what I personally believe, and this is just a personal belief. At the end of the day, I think people are eventually going to all, all want to go back to work. There'll be the alternative work schedules. There'll be a little bit more flexibility. But I think slowly but surely businesses, for the most part, are going to want to have their employees where they have that opportunity to engage um, personally. I mean, if I were a young person now and I were thinking of, of a job and, and, the op and, and my employer said, you never have to come to the office. You can work from home all the, all the time. I'm not sure, I mean, honestly, I'm not sure I'd want that job. I, I want to have that experience to work with my colleagues, to learn from my colleagues, to, to help, you know, in that moment of creation at the water cooler, so to speak. So I, I sort of question some of the strategies personally of some business that are saying no one's ever going to come back to work. There's going to be a different balance. We've opened up the door. We certainly learned that in TransLink mm -hmm. in one week in, in March, where alternative work schedules can work for people for their personal environment, and I'm all for that. So what that new reality is going to be in a couple years, your guess is as good as mine. Um, but I think over time, people are going to want to come back to work. And, and I think, I think the, that's where, it, where it's going to happen. I think the novelty of staying home all the time is, has worn off or is wearing off. And you made such a great point about people gathering. We are social beings, and it really is where that creativity and that innovation comes from for being in rooms together, face to face, to be able to deal with some of the, the big challenges that many businesses are dealing with. I want to move to, for some, a controversial topic around mobility price. And it certainly has been in the media in the last week or so, given the City of Vancouver's uh, plan, its climate action plan. And the Greater Vancouver Board of Trade, we took a, a very vocal approach on this as well. And we, uh, we do have a very strong position around mobility pricing. We are in favor of a regional approach on this. Uh, there's no denying that there's impacts to climate change that we have to address. But maybe walk us through where TransLink is on, on mobility pricing and why it is important important uh, and, the, and the impact that it would have on our region. Yeah. Um, the concept of mobility pricing has been on TransLink's radar screen for a number of years. A couple of years ago, uh, uh, our Mayor's Council and Board formed an independent commission to study uh, the topic. They, they released a report uh, that demonstrated both the reason for it, the advantages of, of, of mobility pricing, and how it might be uh, implemented and it, it is wasn't going to be something that was going to happen immediately, uh, and it's still something we need to be thinking about. Here's some realities: over the next 30 years, this region, this fairly compact geographic region, is set to accommodate over a million more people. Where are they going to live, and how are they going to get around? Million more people. You know, we have a little over two and a half million people now, and all the jobs that go with those million more people. Number one. Number two, there's just no space to build enough roads 
to accommodate that kind of traffic um, increase. That's, that's a reality in, our, in the way that our, our land use is, other than um, tearing up a lot of land um, to build those roads and with the attendant environmental impacts associated with that. Our own modeling as part of our Transport 2050 program demonstrates that over that 30-year period, if we do nothing at all, and if we just carry on exactly as we are now and with maybe a modest incremental increase in public transit, we're going to drown in traffic. So we have to do things differently. Mm -hmm. I believe, and I think the foundation of what we've been thinking about for this thing called mobility pricing is, number one, how do we manage mobility? How do we get the most of the capacity of the transportation network that presents itself, whether it's roads, whether it's active transport, whether it's public transportation? Number two, what are our environmental, our climate objectives? And how can our mobility program assist with our environmental and, and uh, climate objectives. And yes, three, where's the revenue going to come for the ongoing investments? Now, one of the problems is in our environment, about a quarter of TransLink's revenue comes from our 18 and a half cent uh, uh, per liter mm -hmm. gas tax. And as electric cars come, that money's going to go away. We've got to figure out a way to replace it. So it's first and foremost about these policy objectives, mobility, how you get people moving. And what we've seen throughout the word, Stockholm, Milan, London, Singapore, when done well, congestion pricing, mobility pricing has a lot of advantages. The story about Stockholm, initially it was very, very, there's significant public opposition. They did a pilot and the people, the residents, motorists um, understood, wow, my, my travel's faster now. It's more convenient and more reliable. And by the way, you can do pricing based on peak times. It might be free to drive in the off-peak period, and you might have to pay something in the peak period. So it's something we've got to continue to examine, but in a policy environment. What are your policy objectives? Where do you want to be in the future? What's the best way to, look at, uh, to get there? And what are the other options to achieve those policy objectives? In and my view, mobility pricing needs to continue to be part of the conversation. And you mentioned some other cities around the world. Some critics would say, well, Vancouver is totally different, or Greater Vancouver, or Metro Vancouver, our region is very different from Stockholm or from London. So what can we learn from those other jurisdictions if we are going to apply policy in place here? Well, first of all, learning from other jurisdictions is, is incredibly important, where it's been done before. And I think we really studied Stockholm a lot. And Stockholm actually has a lot of similarities. It was done as a regional. Um, program. Um, the population, the land uses are not dissimilar um, to here. And we saw the outcomes where it actually did improve. The uh, net improvement in mobility in terms of flow and reliability and speed uh, of, of mobility. Every metropolitan region in the world that would be thinking about this is going to have its unique characteristics. So any examination of the concept, any development of an approach um, along these lines will have to fit into the unique reality of our, of our geography and our uh, mobility environment without, without a doubt. But it should be very much based on what other metropolitan regions who have either done it or are planning to do it. Look, Los Angeles is thinking about it. San Francisco is thinking about it. The Puget Sound region and state of mm -hmm. Washington are thinking about it. New York City eventually will get there. It's already been approved. They'd probably be the first in North America to do it. Let's be looking at how others are thinking about this as well. Let's just be in the game with the concept. I want to bring the audience into the conversation so we can take a look at some of the Slido questions as well. I've got a few more for you, but I'll hold off for a bit and bring some other folks into the conversation. Uh, and the first one is on mobility pricing, so maybe we'll scoot down to um, the second one. So your response to the City of Vancouver's, oh, the transport pricing in the Metro Core. So really, I mean, there's a lot of questions here about mobility pricing. And so the question I think about, is it eventually intended to fund transit expansion? And that's a, a fair question. I think there's uh, some people out there that maybe are thinking that. So Well, you know, as I said, the, the, the first thing is, what are you trying to achieve? And on the mobility front, in the context of growing congestion, as, it's a beautiful place to live. People want to live here. That's why we're going to see another uh, million people. We're going to drown in traffic. So how do we manage mobility the most effective, cost-effective way to manage mobility. That, that's got to be the first question. It has to drive any policy, um, particular policy outcome. Now, we also do have to have a funding stream to improve the transportation network. Now, a lot of people, and we've thought about this a lot, 
have, have criticized the notion of mobility pricing, particularly outside of the more densely populated urban cores where there is good transit now. Well, don't start pricing my travel if I don't have good options. So there's a cart before the horse mm -hmm. issue. We have to confront that. So if, if mobility pricing is a revenue source, but you don't get the revenue until mobility pricing is in, in place, then when are you going to build those, those transit um, options and opportunities? We've got to figure that out. That's a conundrum. Because I think it is true that if it's going to be hard to sell this for people out in the suburban communities in the Tri-Cities south of the Fraser River, um, if they really don't have great transit, uh, they're going to get turned off to that. We've got, to, we've got to crack that nut. There's no question about that. Hence the need for a regional approach. And uh, yes, and I, it, eventually it's, it's, it's got to be a regional approach because it, it, it gets to the regional mobility, it gets to where our centers are, it gets to where our jobs are. And this, as I said in my opening remarks, this region works best when it thinks regionally. So let's, uh, that's a good segue to Dave Frank's question there at the top of Slido. So around uh, extension of transit, and this particular question is around the extension of the SkyTrain. Should it be an annual line item in the budget or continue with the current Big Bang stop and start approach? Great question. Uh, during the uh, federal elections um, um, all those months ago, the Mayor's Council put out their platform, as did uh, the Federation of uh, Canadian Cities, FCM. And on the transportation front, the key ask in the platform to all three parties in the election was, please commit to a sustained, predictable, long-term funding stream for public transportation in this country, which has not necessarily been the case. When the Trudeau administration in 2016 put out the Public Transportation Infrastructure Fund, it was 10 years, $22 billion of funding, of which we got $3.5 billion. You need a starting point from senior government that signal that you've got a commitment to and the reality of long-term funding that allows regions like here or Toronto or Calgary or wherever else to plan for a sustained program so that it's not start and stop. So the ideal way to do it is a sustained, predictable program where you line up priorities. So at the end of the day, working as a region and all the regional interests see when I get my project. And I can, mine may not come for the ne until 10 years from now. It may not be justified, but I know that the money's going to be there. So I'm going to be patient while something that is, it is more justified now, that's also funded, goes first, while we get our second and we get our third, because you have that sustained long-term funding. Mm -hmm. It's a great question. It's a critical question. It's a matter of really good public policy to get locked in uh, predictable funding long-term. And then the regions will have a much better time figuring out how to prioritize projects and raise the money. Right. So that sort of segues into this next question here about TransLink's key capital priorities, but really assisting with COVID recovery. What can you tell us there? With our, uh, let me read the, with our capital priorities. Capital so, priorities. So mm -hmm. our, you know, we've had to rethink our budget. We've had to rethink our finances. You know, our, our finances are troubled, even with the aid from the federal and provincial governments that gets us through next year. We spend our money on, in effect, three things at TransLink. Daily operations, just paying bus drivers to get service out every day. Um, the big move projects, Surrey Langley SkyTrain, buying more SkyTrain cars, Broadway Subway. And the third, very important on the, on the capital, is maintaining our assets in a state of good repair. You know, the Expo line's, what, 32 years old, 33 mm -hmm. years old now, all right? You, you cannot defer maintenance. These are big. Um, physical assets and you've got to make sure you you have the resources today to do your preventive maintenance your predictive maintenance so you're not passing on defects in the future which a are just more expensive to fix and B means you start having unreliable service you have breakdowns so we do spend money on state of good repair and on my watch and fortunately our policymakers agree with this we're not going to undermine that that has to remain mm -hmm. we're not going to take a short-term problem and create a down the, the stream much bigger problem. So our capital priorities, state of good repair, and we are continuing all the big move projects which are hev heavily leveraged by the federal and provincial governments. So it brings us to the question about the line right out to UBC. Why not build SkyTrain all the way out to UBC? It's never been cheaper to borrow money. Well, um, uh, if somebody were to lay on the, pro on, on the region, the several billions of dollars that it will take to extend it from um, uh, the Arbutus plant station to UBC, 
I'm sure the region would, would welcome that. But the, the reality is it's a lot of money. And borrowing money means you have to pay it back. So you have to have a revenue stream to provide the debt financing. Nothing's free in this world. So we've been studying UBCX, just like, we call it UBCX, sorry, uh, at, at TransLink, just like we've been studying the gondola to SFU. You know, clearly we need to extend um, the Surrey Langley SkyTrain to Langley, uh, as promised. And we have to look at the other um, places that we need to be um, uh, developing high capacity transit. And all of those, North Shore, you know, there's a lot of interest. North Shore, Bridget, you, you might get SkyTrain. <laughs> That's or my your, neighborhood. <laughs> or your, your children or grandchildren <laughs> might get SkyTrain. Mm -hmm. But we have to line up the priorities. We have to think regionally on how the priorities line up, back to my further point. And then we have to find those funding streams. So it's, it's back to the same point. Let's see where our senior partners are first, because they characteristically pay 70 to 80 percent of the cost mm -hmm. of the big projects. Provide that national funding, which leverages provincial funding. Set up those, those projects in priority order. Then we will find the money that we will need to then pay for the, the debt finance on our side and then the operating cost. What are your thoughts on the high speed rail uh, around the Cascor in the Cascadia, Cascadia corridor? The words were not coming out of my mouth very well. Do you think that that's a, a possibility in the near future? Is this one that is maybe much more of a longer term play possibly? Yeah, I, I see we only have 35 seconds left, so I could go on for a long time. I've been involved in the Cascadia Innovation Corridor. I actually co-chair uh, what we call the Housing uh, Connectivity and Transportation uh, uh, Committee, and the high speed rail project has been uh, a big uh, element of that. Portland, Seattle, and Vancouver are all facing a very, very similar set of challenges that I've already talked about, number one. Number two, you know, trade between the state of Washington and, and, and British Columbia is huge. There's, there's so many things that bind us together. And as a mega region, from Portland all the way up here, um, the, the, the GDP of this mega region now is, is huge. There's so much potential. And if we're trying to figure out future land uses, there's, there's housing affordability problems in Seattle, just like here. Eventually, that'll happen in Portland. How do we further bind you know, those three big urban uh, areas together and at the same time think about um, from a housing affordability and location standpoint, where in Seattle, where are people going to live in the future? Same problem. They're hemmed in geographically and using um, high speed information flow, 5G, 7G, 10G, whatever it is, you can shrink the, the distances. The Secretary of Department of Transportation in Washington points out just to add one extra lane on I-5 from the Oregon border to the BC border uh, would, would take years and years and cost a fraction of the high speed rail. So I don't necessarily advocate per se high speed rail or that technology, but the notion of connecting urban areas with fast, reliable transportation to open up new places for people to live and work, um, supported by our you know, technology advance, it's a fascinating idea. And I know you're, you're in the role till February, but I want, do want to stop here and uh, just maybe ask a last question and that is much more personally focused is, what's next for you after February? I don't know. <laughs> uh, as I say to people, you know, candidly, it's now time to me f for me to figure out what I want to do when I grow up. <laughs> so, I, you know, I've been in the transit industry for a long time now. It's, it's a, a crazy, uh, challenging, frustrating, fascinating, and at the end of the day, incredibly reward rewarding business because we serve people. And as much as you know, we're the brunt of criticism all the time. We're always out there. When, when we touch someone and I get a letter or a call from somebody who said, you did something good for me. And even during the height of the pandemic, you know, those essential workers that we were transporting, you know, I go to bed at night feeling good about what I'm doing and I wake up in the morning feeling really good about what we do uh, in our industry. So I don't know what my, my next steps are gonna be. I have a lot of ideas, a lot of things that I still wanna do and contribute uh, to, to the world. But, uh, I still have time. I still have a lot of work to do uh, here, but it's been a great ride here in Vancouver. Well, I do want to thank you for your leadership. You have achieved a great deal in your time at TransLink and left an indelible mark on our region. And also a personal thank you. You've been a strong contributor and leader on our board of directors at the Greater Vancouver Board of Trade, and you will be missed, even though you're here till February. Now, we're not quite done. I would like to introduce a surprise guest, the Lieutenant Governor of British Columbia, the Honourable Janet Austin, who has joined us for some special remarks. Nice to see you. <laughs> it's lovely to see you too, Bridget. And hi, Kevin. It's wonderful to see you as well. Hi, Janet. Um, 
Hi. Uh, first, I, I want to add my thanks um, uh, Bridget, thank, to Bridget's comments uh, um, for Kevin's, uh, what I think of as being characteristically cogent, uh, content-rich, and frankly inspiring assessment of the state and the future of public transit in Metro Vancouver. I think all of us in the audience today can see why the people who've had the privilege of working with Kevin are so very, very sorry to be losing him. And I am certainly one of those people. Uh, I first met Kevin when I joined the TransLink board. Uh, that was shortly after he had assumed the role of president and CEO. Uh, and Kevin, hearing you speak today reminds me of how much I enjoyed that experience, how much I learned from it, and how much I miss all of you. Uh, Kevin stepped in at TransLink at a very difficult time, and I expect uh, most of you remember that. Public confidence in the organization was at a low point. Uh, the organization was facing criticism on many fronts, and it was increasingly difficult to garner the financial support needed to upgrade and expand what at that time was an aging system. Uh, it was clear that TransLink needed new leadership and fresh ideas, and, and uh, Kevin certainly provided them. He brought vision, drive, credibility, always grounded in significant operating experience and confident leadership. He shaped a compelling, uh, future-oriented vision for the organization and was successful in attracting the financial and political support to execute it. And as you've heard, uh, he continues to be focused on that future orientation in a way that reflects the reality and the legacy of this pandemic and the other challenges that we face in contemporary society. Uh, Kevin inspired the trust and the confidence of the Mayor's Council, of board and staff of TransLink, and of government funders and stakeholders. And he placed the highest priority on improving the customer experience with really, truly outstanding results. So as you heard from Kevin, an integrated uh, public transit agency like Transit, uh, TransLink uh, faces pressures on many fronts. It must manage competing demands for service from diverse customers and varied jurisdictions. It must balance short-term operating requirements with the need for long-term infrastructure investment. It must anticipate and plan for massive changes in technology in a rapidly evolving context. And it must achieve consensus among key players in order to advance a common strategy. And of course, in times of challenge or crisis, such as we now experience, it must be sufficiently nimble and flexible to balance the uh, safety and service. And uh, Kevin, you've done an excellent job there as well. So all of this is complicated and it's not easy, but Kevin handled it all with energy and with confidence. Personally, I saw TransLink transformed from an organization that was constantly in the news and not with good news stories into this exciting, cool organization with a contemporary vibe uh, very creative communications, a sense of humor, and an energetic cadre of youthful champions. People just wanted to be part of it. And uh, honestly, it turned me into a wannabe transit geek. <laughs> so all of this did not go unnoticed. Uh, under Kevin's leadership, TransLink was named the top transit system in North America by the American Public Transit Association. That's not an easy thing to do. And when you consider the challenges that had to be overcome to achieve that in a short period of time, uh, it is really exceptional. Uh, TransLink also repeatedly named one of BC's top employers and one of Canada, Canada's greenest employers. And of course, there were many other successes as well. I want to share just briefly a few comments um, from those people who have worked most closely with Kevin and know him best. So here from J uh, Mayor Jonathan Cote, who is the <laughs> Mayor's Council Chair, it's been an absolute pleasure to work with Kevin during his time at TransLink. We have all seen a lot of successes with the organization over the past five years, and Kevin's leadership has played a pivotal role in improving and expanding the public transit system in our region. Here from Board Chair Tony Gugliotta, without a doubt, we are sorry to see Kevin step away, but he's leaving behind an organization that is stronger and more responsive to our customers and our communities and better prepared than ever for the future. And from his colleagues on the executive team, Kevin pushes us all, from the senior leadership team to our frontline employees, to focus on delivering an exceptional and reliable service for our customers. With that foundation in place, we've reached record uh, ridership levels, signed historic partnerships, and seen a dramatic improvement in the public's opinion of TransLink. 
So Kevin, on a personal note, I feel very privileged to have had the opportunity to work with you, and I'm proud to be counted among your many fans. Uh, the role of the Lieutenant Governor is different here in British Columbia than it is in the United States. Uh, here, as you know, we have a separation of state and government. So as the representative of our head of state, Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II, Queen of Canada, and on behalf of all British Columbians, I want to thank you for your truly splendid work and your many contributions to our region and our province. We are so very sorry to lose you, but we wish for you every possible happiness and success in your future life and work. Be well, be safe, and know that you will be missed. Hi, uh, Well, thank you so much, Janet and uh, Lieutenant Governor. That was, uh, <laughs> I don't know what to say. That's uh, uh, quite a surprise. <laughs> Thank you. It's, it was delightful working uh, with you on the board, uh, too. But it's been my pleasure to be doing everything that I've done here in uh, Metro Van Vancouver at TransLink. And I will, of course, cherish and remember my, my time here. But uh, most important is keep the momentum going. Well, absolutely. And you certainly laid the groundwork for that. So we all appreciate you very much indeed. We're going to miss you so much. If you ever change your mind. <laughs> here in Metro Vancouver, no pressure. All the best, Kevin. Take good care. Thank you. Thank you. And back to Bridget. <laughs> Thank you very much, Your Honor. Uh, can't echo those comments enough. I mean, really, Kevin, it's your vision and your collaboration that really has drove trust and confidence. And really, you made such a mark. And I know you have three months left in the role. So uh, the, the goodbyes and the kudos will continue to come. So thank you for joining us today and laying out your vision for the future as well for TransLink. And in closing, a special thank you to all of our sponsors again for making today's event possible. Every December, we host an important discussion around energy and this year is no different except for the fact that the event will be held virtually over two days. So join us on December 1st and 3rd for our energy forum presented by Bennett Jones. Taking both traditional and renewable sources into consideration, this year's forum will explore how global trends are impacting planning, investment and strategies across the energy sector. To register, go to boardoftrade.com energy. Thank you to everyone for being part of today's virtual event and we look forward to connecting again soon.